All right, now let's look at the, the points of difference which Paul here brings out between the law and grace. In verse 3, for as much as he are manifestly declared to be the letter of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. There's the first difference. Law writes with ink on tables. Grace writes with the Holy Spirit. And then again, not on tables of stone. The law was written on tables of stone, but in the tables of the hearts of believers. Here, I believe, is the very essence of it. The law is outside you, it's written on tables of stone, it says do this, don't do that, and if you do that, you'll be punished. And you look at it and you say, I mustn't do this, I must do that, and you end up by doing the exact opposite of what you decide to do. Why? Because inside you is an uncrucified rebel. And the more he's confronted with the law, the more rebellious he becomes. We've seen that already. The law stirs up and strengthens sin. So God says, put the rebel to death, create a new nature in him, and then by my spirit I'll write on the heart of the new man inside him. All right, let's go on. Verse 6. God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. We don't write letters, we write spiritual truth on the hearts of believers. And then in verses 6 and 7, The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And then Paul talks about the law as the ministration of death. The law brings death. The letter of the word kills. But the spirit gives life. So the law is the ministration of death. Grace is the ministration of life. I don't know whether you've ever stopped to think about the number of funerals that took place in the Exodus. It's breathtaking. 600,000 able-bodied men of war came out of Egypt with Moses. And only two of them, 40 years later, entered the Promised Land. 600,000 men had died, and presumably about the same number of women. 1,200,000 people died in 40 years. That's 30,000 a year. 30,000 people died a year. That's an aspect of the law we don't easily see. The law brought death. The Spirit brings life. All right, we'll go on. Verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. The law brings condemnation. Grace brings righteousness. A lady came up to me somewhat perplexed at the end of yesterday morning when I said, it's the devil who makes people feel guilty. But it is. See, we're not used to thinking that way. I said, the devil is the one who makes people feel guilty. We're so used to thinking that when we feel guilty, we're pretty religious. That we're not happy if we don't feel guilty. But remember, it's the devil and the law that minister condemnation. Grace ministers righteousness. In the gospel, it's not our aim to make people feel guilty. It's our aim to assure people that they've been made righteous. It's easy to make people feel guilty. It's not so easy to assure people that they're righteous. All right, verses 10 and 11. For even that which was made glorious, the law, had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth, that's the glory of the gospel and of grace. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now Paul is referring to the fact that when Moses came down from the mountain after communing with God for forty days and forty nights and receiving the law, his face shone. So much that he scared his fellow Israelites, they didn't want to come near him. 
So there was a superficial glory. It says the skin of his face shone. So in order not to scare them, he put a veil over his face and talked with them from under a veil. But when he went into the tabernacle to commune with the Lord, he took the veil off. Paul says that veil still remains on the heart of the Jewish people. They cannot see the end of the law. They see its superficial glory, but they do not see that that glory is done away. And so it is today. But the glory of the gospel is eternal. It's an unfading, eternal glory. Now this to me is very significant. Because I find out that when you have a legalistic religious system, it has a certain superficial glory. It has pomp, ceremony, vestments, organs, choirs, a whole array of things that impress the soulish man. But it's impermanent. The gospel brings a permanent glory, but it's spiritual. And the soulish man doesn't appreciate the spiritual glory of the gospel. That's why religious people don't enjoy the liberty that we have in the Holy Spirit. Because one is soulish, the other is spiritual. See, you can have very, very beautiful religious buildings and very well-trained choirs and highly educated preachers it has a certain temporary superficial glory. But the glory of the true gospel is a glory that fills the heart and it's permanent. And it's somewhat like what the Lord said, no man having tasted the old wine straightway desireth the new. For the old saith he is better. When you're used to the, the glory of legalism, you don't immediately want to go in for the glory of the gospel. But bear in mind, the glory of the law is temporary. It doesn't last. I've been in some of the most famous religious buildings of Britain. I grew up in them. I spent hours in them. King's College Chapel is probably one of the most famous religious buildings in Europe, in fact, in the world. And its choir is justly world famous. And I've sat in that building and listened to that beautiful music and that beautiful architecture with the carved woodwork, the beautiful stained glass windows. And I acknowledge a certain glory. But you walk out and ten minutes later you're as cold as a dead duck. It doesn't last. I don't know why, but God is really dealing with me about this. We've got to see the difference between the superficial, soulish, impermanent glory and the true, inward, spiritual, abiding glory. Finally, uh, the seventh point of distinction, verses 12 and 13. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses who put a veil over his face. Uh, the law is veiled. It doesn't come out and say it clearly. But the gospel tells it like it is. We use great plainness of speech. I made a study once of what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. And I found there are 15 places in the New Testament where it speaks about being filled with or full of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly enough, 14 of them are in the writings of Luke. And one is in the writings of Paul. I discovered that there are eight individuals who are said to have been at one time filled with or full of the Holy Spirit. And I began to study what kind of persons they were. Let me tell you quickly, five of them died as martyrs. That's over 50%. So, next time you ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, just pause for a moment and consider the statistical probabilities. I discovered that in almost every case there was a free verbal expression. It came out through the mouth. I discovered in almost every case there was a very powerful impact on the total situation. I discovered that each one of these persons had a free forgiving spirit. 
I discovered that each one encountered unusual satanic opposition, and the other interesting point was each of them was a person of very plain speech. And I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit honors plain speech. He's the spirit of truth, and he blesses us when we tell it like it is. And I'm suspicious of things that have to be wrapped up in allegories and figures and types. I believe in typical teaching, shadows and types, but never as a basis for establishing doctrine. Doctrine is established from the clear, simple statements of the New Testament. Then we can go back to the historical patterns, the patterns of the sacrifices, the tabernacles. I love them. But they never establish truth. They only illustrate it. I've heard more screwy interpretations of the Feast of Tabernacles than I can count. I'd like to know the real interpretation. I tell you I would. All right, let's go back quickly over this and try to arrive at a summation. The seven points of difference between the operation of the law and the operation of grace. The law writes with ink, grace writes with the Holy Spirit. The law writes on external tables of stone or other material. Grace writes on the internal tables of the heart of the renewed believer. The law writes letters, Grace writes spiritual truth. The law ministers death. Grace ministers life. The law ministers condemnation. Grace ministers righteousness. The law has a temporary glory. Grace has an abiding and exceeding glory. The law used is veiled speech. Grace uses free, open language. Now, let's look down to the end of that third chapter of 2 Corinthians and look at the closing verse, which I believe sums it up, and which is a very beautiful verse. But we all, with open face, the Greek says with unveiled face, it's the contrast with Moses who had the veil over his face. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. What is the mirror? The word of God, that's right. God's word is the mirror. With unveiled faith, with opened understanding, we look in the mirror of God's word. And as we look, the Holy Spirit reveals to us what? The glory of what we are in Christ. We better read the verse and then I'll explain. But we all with unveiled faith Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being continually changed into the likeness of what we behold from glory to glory even by the Lord the Spirit. That's the right way to put it. There's the, one of the places that emphasizes that the Spirit is Lord and he's a person. So you see we are not saying we don't need the Bible. On the contrary, we're saying the Holy Spirit only works while we look in the mirror. When we take our eyes off the mirror, the Holy Spirit no longer works. But as long as we're looking in the mirror, renewed in our minds, children of God, the Holy Spirit reveals to us from the mirror the glory of the Lord. And as we look at that glory, the Holy Spirit changes us into the likeness of what we behold. And we say, praise God, that's glory. And the Holy Spirit says, that's only the first step. It's from glory to glory. It's continually unfolding, increasing, and progressing. As I've already pointed out, there's no stopping point. So, can we, I wonder if we can make that clear, because I believe this is the crux of what I'm trying to say. How does grace operate? How are we related to the scripture? It's not a set of laws hanging on the walls telling us what to do. It's a means that the Holy Spirit uses as we look at it with unveiled understanding in faith the Holy Spirit imparts to us what we're looking at. It becomes part of us. He writes on the tables of our heart. We see the glory of Jesus and we're changed into the same likeness as what we behold. The moment we cease to look in the mirror the Holy Spirit has to suspend his operations. He can do no more for us until we get our eyes back in the mirror. Keep your finger there and just look for a moment in Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 29, speaking about those whom God foreknew and predestinated. For those whom God foreknew, he also did predestinate. To go to heaven? No. So many t people talk about predestination as if we're predestinated to go to heaven, but that's not what it says. He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what we're predestinated to. I have no difficulty in believing that somebody who's conformed to the image of Christ has been predestinated. That doesn't create any problems. But if a person sits in church, miserable, sour, and unattractive, and says, I'm predestinated, I say, where's the evidence? For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he, the Son, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. I don't know, I want to illustrate this with a little story some of you may have heard before. Just relax for a moment and we come back to the application. Uh, a good many years ago, about three or four hundred years ago, I'm sorry to say that the Anglican Church of England was bitterly persecuting the Christians of Scotland. That must have been at least 400 years ago. It was before they were a united kingdom. The Scottish believers were known as the Covenanters. Have you ever heard of the Covenanters? They signed their covenant in their own blood, you know. They were a little, dedicated, loyal group. And they were bitterly persecuted by the Church of England uh, and the British or the English soldiers. And one day, a Scottish lassie was sneaking out to a secret meeting of believers and she was stopped by an English soldier. And he said, where are you going? Now, being a real dedicated Christian, she didn't want to lie. But likewise, she didn't want to betray her fellow believers. So she sent a little quick telegram up to heaven and got the answer from the Lord. And this is the answer she gave to the question, where are you going? My eldest brother died, and I'm going to my father's house to hear the will read. <laughs> All right. See, Jesus is the elder brother. He's the firstborn among many brethren. And the New Testament is his will. <laughs> and if you study it, it tells us our inheritance. And when you look in it, with the eye of faith, you see what we become in Christ, and as you see it, the Holy Spirit changes you into it. All right, we go to one other passage, which is Hebrews chapter 8, which points out three ways in which the new covenant differs from the old. Now this passage in Hebrews chapter 8 is a quotation of Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. I'm not going to read Jeremiah, but at your leisure you would do well to have a look at it. So Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 7, and reading through verse 12. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. If the first covenant had met all man's needs, there never would have been a new covenant. For finding fault with them, not with the covenant, but with the people, God says, Behold, the days comes that the Lord will when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. It's not like the covenant of the law. Now, the scripture goes on to explain the nature of this new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now looking in verses 10, 11, and 12, you get the three ways in which the new covenant differs from the old. In verse 10, the Holy Spirit writes the laws of God not on tables of stone as something outside us that we have to try to keep, but writes them in our hearts and minds where they are naturally expressed in the things that we do. Because Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What you have in your heart will determine the way you live. When God's laws are written in your heart, you will live God's way. So this is the first 
different, the Holy Spirit writes those laws which God wants to keep. What are the two basic laws? Love for God, love for our name. He writes them on our hearts. Secondly, every believer knows God direct. We don't have to keep, teach people, know the law, because all will know me from the least to the greatest. You notice it starts with the least and goes up to the greatest. Except you become as a little child, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. It starts with the least. Every believer has a direct personal knowledge of God. He's directly related to God, not through a mediator. Let's look at two scriptures. Keep your finger in Hebrews 8. John 17 and verse 3. Jesus said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's a direct personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it is not through a mediator. Uh, this is where we're in Galatians chapter 3. A mediator is somebody who goes between two persons who are not directly related. But that's not the way it is in the New Covenant. Galatians 3, 19 and 20. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Moses was the mediator and the law was not given direct by God. It was given by angels to Moses who was the mediator between heaven and earth. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. There are two distinct persons where you have a mediator, separated by the mediator. A mediator, though he brings people into contact with each other, actually comes between them. But God is one. So when you meet Jesus Christ, you meet God. There's no mediator. So that's the second difference. Every believer knows God directly in Jesus Christ. Going back to Hebrews 8, verse 12, the third difference is there's no more consciousness of sin, no more offerings for sin. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The very memory of our sin has been blotted out from God's consciousness. Just turn to Hebrews 10 for a moment and look at that emphasized again in verses 15 through 18. Well, I'll read verse 14 through 18. Hebrews 10 verses 14 through 18. For by one offering, by one sacrifice, he, Jesus Christ, hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. If our sins have been forgotten, we're not going to need another sin offering. So, the third point of difference is, there's been one final sufficient sin offering, and there are no more sin offerings required. Let's just read that again to, to renew our understanding of it. The three ways in which the new covenant differs from the old according to Hebrews chapter 8. First of all, the Holy Spirit writes God's laws in our hearts and minds, not on tables of stone. Secondly, each believer knows God directly and personally without any mediator. Thirdly, sin has been finally dealt with and put away and no further sacrifice for sin is therefore required. Now, we come to the final summing up statement which uh, I've written here and I want to read it out. Grace is worked out by a continuing supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit. The two important words are continuing and supernatural. Grace never operates on the plane of our natural ability. And it's continuing. Once we start to think that we can do it by ourselves, we're out of grace. Once we start to think, it's all over, I've got it now, we're out of grace. See, these are the two big problems that keep us from living in grace. First of all, we begin to think, well, now I can really make it. I've got it made. I can do it. 
you're out of grace. The other which is similar is, I've got it. And just when you think you've got it, you're out of it. So, grace operates by a continuing, unceasing, supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit. I think I'll just tell you this little picture. To me, you can sum up or picturize the difference between law and grace, like the difference between a map and a personal guide. The law is a perfect map. Grace offers us a personal guide. Who is the guide? No, the Holy Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. So every man says, give me the map. I can make it. God says, alright, there's the map. Perfect. Every detail correct. So off you go. And a little while later, it's dark, cold. You're on the edge of a precipice. You don't know whether you're facing north, south, east or west. You're miserable and lonely. You've got the map in your hand. You're lost. And a sweet voice says to you so gently, Can I help you? And you say, God, I need you. And right there by your side is the Holy Spirit. He says, Take my hand, I'll lead you. Well, after a little while, the scene has changed. You're right on, on the highway, the road is paved, the sun is shining, the birds are singing. And you think it really wasn't so bad after all. I believe I could have made it. And then you, you turn to the Holy Spirit and you say, you know, I, I started out with a real good man. And uh, I think if I were just to take a little time, I could find out where we are now. And if I really knew where we are on the map, I'd be able to make it. So you get out the map and you start looking at it. And after a while you say, that's where we are. Do you see that? But there's no one there. Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit says, if you can do it with a map, you don't need me. Doesn't that happen to you? If you can make it with a man, why trouble the Holy Spirit? But you can't. When you say to the Holy Spirit, here's a good man, the Holy Spirit says, thanks, I know the way, I don't need the man. You've got the choice. Which will it be, the man or the guide? If it's going to be the guide, it's got to be the guide all the time, all the way. He won't have little sections where you can travel by the map and then you need him again. The guide all the time, all the way. In this new life, we are 100% dependent on the Holy Spirit. The final scripture, Romans 6, 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, one important question is, what is the glory of the Father? What is the glory of the Father? I didn't hear you. No. The Holy Spirit. That's right. Keep your finger in Romans 6, 4 and turn to Romans 1, 4. Romans 1, 3 and 4 says, The gospel concerns God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared or set apart as the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, that's a Hebraism for the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection from the dead. What raised Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit. And in Romans 6, 4 it says he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So the glory of the Father is the Holy Spirit. All right, going back to Romans 6, 4, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in this new life. Listen, Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. He totally depended on the Father to raise him by the Spirit. And just as totally as Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit for the resurrection, so totally do we have to depend on the Holy Spirit for the ability to lead this new life. We need the Holy Spirit every moment, all the way. We cannot do it without. This is the biggest problem. And I venture to say that those who have known the Holy Spirit in his power through the baptism and then try to do without are the deadest of the dead. 
They're even deader than the people that have never known the Holy Spirit. And this is our big danger. It's starting in the Spirit and then saying, now I think I can do it with the man. You can't. You're dependent on the Holy Spirit every moment, every hour, every day. Grace operates only by the continuing supernatural presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives.